Thank you very much, Land. I was sort of wondering when you were speaking and, and you were inviting me up to the floor to do the sort of thing with the balls. I actually have a dysfunctional shoulder, so that's why I refrained. But I was sort of wondering whether I was in a dysfunctional state. <laughs> it's now time for questions, comments, and I'd like to invite people from here, but there are also people who are accompanying this by uh, the webcast, which we will uh, be asking to comment. I'm going to start in this side and then sort of gradually move over here. And um, what I'm suggesting is that we sort of take three comments, three observations, and then give Land a chance uh, to respond. And I will sort of try to at least keep an eye on uh, who might want to jump in to the discussion. So anyone wants to go first? Nobody this side? You sure? Yes? Hello. When you said that uh, when folk should find their own ways, what happens if they have all kind of, kind of, kinds of aggressive ways? Um, well, lots of examples, but when you said about Indonesia, for example, after the um, financial crisis in Asia, in Indonesia they had all kinds of problems aggression toward other people, for example, the ethnic Chinese. Please say your name and at least where you come from. So, uh, I should have mentioned. so my name is Rob Galanders. I just started working in uh, Alto University. Um, and I'll, I'll ask this question in the, in the kind of juggling and I'll, or metaphor you introduced. Do you think your apprentice juggler would have juggled better on his first try with a, an incentive? Hi, uh, Andy here from uh, Alto University. Um, Trying to use the knowledge that you, just, that you spoke about, how that we all are aware. Uh, we've been trying to use this with uh, things like uh, hand washing and sanitation and hygiene. We, we know for a fact that uh, we as adults may not know how to wash our hands. And we don't want to be told that we don't know how to wash our hands. So we tried to focus our education on the children. So we showed and taught children with the, with the, or with the adults present so that we could give a little sneaky wink to each other that we taught the children and the children were glad to learn but then we looked at each other and could admit that we didn't know that but it was something that we didn't want to highlight the fact that I know you don't know but we both know that we may not know as much as we should know but if we can find a way to teach the children and be in that vicinity and learn at the same time so use the the negative uh, situation that you spoke about as a positive opportunity Okay, thank you, Lance. You want to try to address these three? Sure. So, <clears throat> uh, there's the there's a right level of conflict and there's a wrong level of conflict, and what mostly people try and do is avoid all conflict, but nearly every successful institution grows out of conflict. So. If you, avoid, if you suppress the conflict, and external actors can easily suppress conflicts, uh, if you suppress all of the conflict, you may well be uh, suppressing precisely the arenas in which people will arrive at solutions that they can then live by. And you just perpetuate problems by having suppressed them and let them go on longer. If you look at the history of any now developed country, it was full of all kinds of aggression. And, uh, you know, the premature suppression of what looks like aggression in the interest of order uh, often can, you know, just let a problem fester uh, and not re ever re... No one ever then feels like the conflict was settled in a way they can live with. So, now, that said, you know, am I promoting civil war? Am I promoting that people be allowed to cut people's heads off? No, of course not. But... Uh, the, the level to which the international community has preferred order, even if externally imposed, uh, and top-down, uh, especially if imposed by a government they like, over allowing people to work problems out in ways that look quite chaotic has probably been on the, too much on the preference for an externally imposed top-down order over letting the processes play out that is going to include you know, a certain healthy amount of conflict, uh, a certain healthy amount of disputation. So 
behind any successful institution, there is usually that the institution arose to settle a conflict. Uh, and, and hence, the premature skipping the conflict straight to the institution, uh, I, I just don't believe. It ha again, we're, we're in an environment in which all, lots of things have been tried. So, you know, uh, um, you know, if a lot of these ideas of, of avoiding this aggression by suppressing it were to have worked, it would have worked better and we wouldn't be in the deteriorating situation I feel that we're in now in lots of places where the aggression is just coming out, having been suppressed in an even more virulent form. So uh, the question about incentives. The question is, of, you know, I, I don't like to use the word incentives. I like to use the word motivation. And if you ask me the question, would the incipient juggler had become a better juggler had they been motivated? It's kind of obvious that yes, they have to have been motivated. Incentives can only be a form of motivation if you can control the states of the world in which the incentives are paid. So the nurses program was an attempt to impose incentives on nurses' attendance when they didn't have any motivation. And what they learned was that if your incentives contradict the motivation, the motivation will win. And so even though I'm an economist, I am very much more about what's the motivation, what's the account here, not what's the accounting, not will I get some dollars and cents if I juggle three more balls than I did yesterday, but moreover, do I want to juggle? Uh, and the difficulty is in a lot of the area, in a lot of the arenas, the internal folk culture of wanting to be a juggler is what has fundamentally broken down. The idea of what it is to be a policeman, the idea of what it is to be a postman, is now perfectly compatible with not delivering any mail, with not actually enforcing the law. And I think until you fix that problem, incentives can't be a part of the solution because you can't control the incentives themselves. Okay, The thing about children and stuff, uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, kids are great, washing hands is great, sanitation is great. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not really most people's problem. So people, you know, part of the problem is, is that lots of the externally driven ideas about how to make people's lives better don't count on that they might just not be concerned about the problem that you want them to be concerned about. And that's often just a deep, they just don't care about what you're trying to do. And, and I think asking more deeply what is the problem that they are caring about, that they're not caring about mine, might actually be an instructive exercise sometimes. That said, kids are great, washing hands is great. I'm Rob Davies from Zimbabwe. Um, I, I think it's fantastic what you said. Really, really had a lot of meat and Could you stand up? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Repeat that first part. Uh, <laughs> it was a great paper and great presentation. Just, just picking a, a bone with actually your last slide, which has just been taken off, where you, where you, uh, you start off saying, yeah, a solution people don't want. I think there's a slip there. It's, it's not people who don't want it. Uh, and, and your presentation of that, it's a, a solution that some people involved in governments exactly. and some do, do not want. Right. And, and one of the things which I suspect is in the part you skipped over, you know, the addressing of of interests, and right. uh, which I presume is why it's so difficult to, uh, to build something on top of what was there, rather right. than new. You've got to take into account those interests that are obstacles. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we, we, we'll, we'll come, come back to that. Bazar of Nicaragua, thank you so much for your brilliant presentation. Well, you are a brilliant economist, and I wonder if you were the president of the USA or the chairman of the World Bank or... Yeah, okay. 
IMF, one of these very important uh, organizations, with regard to your research, what would you do to improve this situation with the failing states and all that? Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you very much for a, a great presentation. I was, um, we had uh, Paul Collier here maybe a year ago, and he seems to share a lot of your um, skepticism about how easily we can take uh, an institution from the West and impose it, say, on countries in Africa. And he seems to be more pessimistic than you are. He thinks that uh, African governments should outsource, privatize the postal service. Uh, that's one way to start again. Um, I don't know if, if you would share that, 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 that sentiment, one way to get, get past the, the inertia. Um, you seem to be more positive about uh, being able to reform or set up or revise um, or start again uh, with, within government. Do you have any examples of a successful reform? Has there been a police service that's been reformed or that, that you have uh, to, in, in hand? Okay, thanks. So let, let, I mean, let, me, let me start. Um, so I'm not going to disagree directly with Paul Collier. Um, but let me disagree directly with Paul Collier. Um, I changed my mind. Um, no, because the difficulty is uh, countries like Finland, countries like Great Britain, countries like, you know, Germany, they have a huge amount of capability that they have acquired through a historical process of struggle that then gets routinized in super high capability organizations. So any small fraction of that capability could easily be channeled into outsourced things that could drop into any country in the world that's small and kind of make a huge difference in the short run. But I don't get what the long run vision is. Is what's the path from where we are to where you want to be that goes that direction? So how do we then get out of those guys? Or once we're outsourced them, do they become the new police force? Do they become the new government? How, you know, it's just, I don't get what the end game is. So I get the impetus to do it because we have a lot of capability and, and they, you know, and Paul, I, which is why I like to talk about India. Because for India, that's not even an option, right? No Indian government's going to allow you to pop in with independent service authorities and go around the government. So you got to fix the government. And I think that's a much more typical situation. So I just don't, I see it as an extemporizing measure uh, uh, as opposed to kind of really a long-term development strategy. And mine has much less chance of immediate success, but I just don't see, I've never heard articulated this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then Kenya does it on their own. And until I hear that, I'm a little suspicious of getting off onto a path that might lock us into a whole different set of interests. So having Halliburton provide security in Afghanistan. Uh, anyway, enough said. Go back to this first question. I did slip a lot, skip a lot of slides about interests. And Partly, that's why I call this an incrementally strategic. What do I mean by incrementally strategic? What I mean is, let's not take the interests head on. Let's start by creating successes that accumulate into ways in which we can eventually challenge the interests. So, you know, part of the issue is, how do you put together some pathway towards success? And I don't think the pathway towards success you know, the metaphor I often use is the interests are going to defend their interests, and if you attack their hardcore economic and political interests directly head on, you're not going to win, right? So, but there are spaces into which you can move successfully and consolidate from there. Um, so, you know, I, I worked with uh, my friend Scott Guggenheim on designing a large scale bottom up kind of program as a way of changing in which local governments budgeted and decided on controlling their own funds. And it started as a project, expanded, expanded to where now it's become the default way in which local governments do their things by building from an incremental base where you weren't yet challenging the powers that be over contracting. And then by proving its success, it could erode them from below. Um, so, and by the way, I say solutions they don't want, not us, of course, right? 
lots of people that do want these solutions, but the they, and the they for some reason are always not very good people, but the they don't want those solutions, not us, of course. Um, finally, if I were president of the World Bank, I would do this, meaning it's perfectly possible to take your portfolio of projects in the world, go to governments and say, look, we have to move a billion dollars in your country, 800 million we're going to move in the standard ways that we move money, we'll do that right? But we want to take some amount of the money, we want to work with you to nominate, you know, get beneath the top, nominate problems on which you're willing to work in innovative ways, and then we'll provide you extra support to that policy deviation, right? That often is going to provide a large amount of support on a very focalized problem and build that up. It's not going to be 100% of the portfolio of large development organizations. DFID is not going to take 80% of its portfolio and start doing this. What they're going to do is they're going to create this space with 10% of the portfolio, 15% of the portfolio, for the people at DFID to work with locally motivated partners to build this kind of success. But until you break it out of the top, you know, until you break it out of the need to move these large amounts of resources, which is a perfectly legitimate target, you have to have multiple instruments for multiple goals, and it would be Inside any of these organizations, if I were in control, you could create this in a year. Uh, because inside these organizations are people desperate to break out of the existing process controls that prevent them from doing this. Uh, thanks. Uh, we have uh, more than 300 people watching this all over the world, as we saw on Finn's map. And some have put some questions here. We will not be able to answer them all, but some of them. Uh, one. Uh, Big one is how should the development framework look like after 2015, talking about the MDGs, and how should it be developed? This is from Mayu, a student in Finland. The next one is from Philippines. What is the difference between strategic bottom-up approach and participatory, participatory process of development? And can you take a third one? Yeah. Yep. Can you provide a successful example of a posit positive deviation that has applied PDEA. How has the organization structurally allowed for failure? The first question is a great question, just way too hard. What the post-2015 development program, what I know it shouldn't look like, though, is what we have now, which is a bunch of very con seemingly concrete, very sort of externally driven goals. Uh, you know, I work a lot on education, you know, the education goal that has been part of the MDGs has been mostly irrelevant to more than half the countries and just not that helpful to the other half. So it's kind of an externally driven thing that, you know, people can comply with. So how one works into the way in which more local nomination of problems, more local definition of problems, and in particular where you worry about the capability to get things done as opposed to naming what it is you think needs to get done and working backwards, is important to be getting there. I don't know how that would go. Um, what's different between what I'm saying and participatory approaches is most participatory approaches in, in the current development practice are actually canalized vertical components of existing top-down projects. So if the person understands what that means, they'll understand what I'm saying. If no one else did, it basically means, you know, a top-down project says we're going to be participatory, so we'll show up and say, you know, here's the space in which you can be participatory about my project that's already designed. Well, yeah, that's a little bit better than not being participatory at all, but that doesn't actually work into any existing process. It doesn't spill over at the local level. It doesn't build capability. It doesn't do any of those things. And in fact, it can, be, it can work against true bottom-up because when you have a participatory process that's part of a top-down scheme, they often subvert the locally, the already ongoing local processes. So, you know, big top-down projects on education in India built participation from parents into the project, but ignored the fact that there were already huge local community and locally elected officials who had as their responsibility, uh, you know, overseeing the schools. So you actually subverted the local government, which was the long-term institutional structure that had its responsibility in the name of participation, which then, of course, is a complete charade because who pays the piper calls the tune. Um, the last question was, 
Oh, like examples. I, I think, I mean, one of the nice things about the experimental approach is it is freeing people up to do experiments. Uh, so, for instance, uh, people looked at what was going on with reading in India and decided that lots of kids were being promoted through to higher grades without having learned to read and then couldn't, you know, they were be given th third grade texts when they couldn't read first grade texts and did, you know, started with remediation in a very local community way, kind of defined the problem, searched for solutions, got feedback, and then finally whole states in India can now scale up this kind of a focus on early grade how to remediate early grade reading deficits by having built this uh, from the bottom up. At the same time, they were building the political sort of willpower for it were to happen. So eventually, the agenda sort of leverages itself inside out. So I think there are lots, I mean, there are lots of examples. Uh, moreover, if you look at the history of any now developed country, it's full of places in which they got from dysfunction dysfunction through policy deviation. So. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Esa. I work for a Finnish NGO called Kepa, and I wanted to ask you if, um, if facts are fictitious, as we saw, uh, how do you feel about the, the boom in development industry uh, on open data, open knowledge, IAD, World Bank's open data, etc.? Thanks. My name is uh, Rabaharski, IMF. So the, uh, you know, I, I loved your, uh, uh, the idea that um, experimenting may generate some some information that would be useful to reform. But then I, 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 I have a general feeling that it, it looks to me that the, your approach is really uh, isolated from the context in which uh, the administration operates. No? So in, if I take the uh, framework that Douglas North uh, uh, refers to when he, uh, he talks about institution, he refers to institution as a set of formal rule, informal norms, and a, uh, basically an enforcement uh, mechanism. So you seem to speak to the uh, issue of the lack of informal norm and the fact that uh, formal rules are useless and, and therefore you want to create some sort of a culture that would reinforce the uh, informal norm, but you don't speak to the issue of an enforcement mechanism because okay, if what? the problem, uh, the enforcement mechanism, say a strong judiciary. Yeah. So my point is if the rent seeker are the problem, then we, you know, motivation is important, but you still need a stick to get, uh, to get people uh, to get their act together and, and act uh, in favor of the public good. So how do, does your approach a, a, you know, fit with this general uh, point that you know, we do, uh, you know, public administration do not evolve in, uh, in isolation from the enforcement mechanism and informal rules. So you speak to the issue of culture, building a culture, but what about the enforcement mechanism? I'm uh, Daryl Sequera. Um, about 30 years ago, I worked for Danida in Tanzania. And on one occasion, um, the higher ups from Copenhagen visited the institution. And uh, when they were leaving, I saw them off. And uh, one of the junior staff members privately asked me, why do people from so far away want to help us? Well, I won't tell you what answer I gave him, but a few days later, there was a, a, a meeting of all Danida experts in Dar es Salaam, where I was invited. And I posed this question to the very same person who had visited the institute, because he was the higher up from Copenhagen. And he said that uh, it's because we know what to do in order to Im improve the country, in order to raise these people to our level of development as we have in the Nordic countries and in Denmark. And that was his answer. Okay. Now that raises a question which I would like to ask you. You have given several examples of the um, incapabilities of so many developing countries. And to a large extent I agree with you because I've observed this myself. But what I would like to ask you is that is whether, uh, whether the um, international development institutions also change facts into fiction. That's a very big question. Because that would, would uh, roll on the, the ball of incapability. So that's one question. The other question uh, concerns the business, the, the, uh, the idea of bottom-up approach. Well, I'm glad that you've experienced in India because 
from my uh, observations over several years, the bottoms-up approach in Goa, which is a rather developed state in India, doesn't work. Uh, the Portuguese, when the Portuguese colonized Goa, they found the age-old system of village management, or village governance, which is uh, more than uh, maybe a thousand years old. They kept that system, and they called it the Comunidad. The British destroyed the system in other parts of India and uh, put in their puppets to manage the villages. But in, the Portuguese recognized the, the land ownership of villages and they allowed the Comunidad to, to function for about four or five hundred years. Then when India took over Goa, they replaced the Comunidad, abused the Comunidad. Um, if we have to recount 400 years, then we might <laughs> run a little bit out of time. Okay. I, I do apologize, okay. but very yes. quickly, uh, very yeah, quickly, very please. quickly, they, they installed the panchayats. In, they right. converted yeah. the communities into panchayats, five-member yeah. village yeah. governance. Right. And those are, uh, panchayats have proved to be incapable of managing the villages. The, the idea is grassroots approach. It has failed in Goa. Thank you. So, so the, the problem with this is it, it's just irrelevant, to tell you the truth. Meaning, kind of the, the kinds of, so, so what we keep looking for are, you know, the distinction between thick accountability, what's the justificatory narrative that we tell about ourselves and others, and thin accountability. What are the facts, right? The problem is you can't fight the deeply corrupted accounts with some additional data because if the data really matters, it can be fabricated, right? Such that you're propagating, in, you know, if we looked at, if we put online, uh, you know, all this information, it's not clear it, what it would do unless we built it into a way in which people could actually have feedback about it and care about it and could change outcomes. So uh, I think a lot of the transparency initiatives so far have been too focused on in thin account, thin information and not focused enough on how it was going to feed into actually motivations and decisions of actors. So, you know, GDP data being available, you know, on the web, you know, fantastic. Not going to make any difference. Uh, enforcement is just exactly, exactly, exactly the wrong way into it. Just completely the wrong way into it. Uh, you know, enforcement only works once you've moved your organization to where nearly everyone is, it has intrinsic motivation and wants to do the good job such that you can focus the enforcement on the few that aren't. Once your system's completely broken, A, you can't, you know, let's say 45% of nurses aren't in attendance. How are we going to punish 45% of nurses? And if we single out these nurses to punish for not being in attendance when those aren't, that's not horizontally equitable. B, precisely what states lack the capability for is to make the decisions of what the enforcement should be. The most corrupt part of many states are the police and the courts. I mean, I can get any decision I want, I can buy out of courts in most countries, right? So the idea that enforcement mechanisms, so enforcement mechanisms depend on your being able to decide what the true state of the world was and punish someone based on that state of the world. But that's precisely what you don't have in these situations. So, yes, eventually you need a good enforcement mechanism. But the question is, what are you going to do in Pakistan? What are you going to do in Afghanistan? What are you going to do in Kenya where you don't have a good enforcement mechanism? Starting from a good enforcement mechanism is just like it gets the causation and cause and effect just completely, completely backwards, in my view. Uh, and, and Douglas North's own theory is a theory of failure. Right? I mean, his story is why everyone fails. So why we want to rely on that story for how to do success. Um, finally, lots of bottom-up fails. I mean, bottom-up's not a panacea. If there were a panacea, we would have found it. The right kind of bottom-up can succeed. So it's not, you know, no one is going to say every form of local government is going to work better than any form of top-down government. And one of the things in the slides I missed is when are the kinds of activities you want bottom-up and what are the kinds of activities for which top-down really might work and a professionalized top-down approach probably work. And the question is getting to the problems and letting them sort themselves out into which requires which. But no, there is no romantic illusion in my mind that if we just let people left to their own devices, they'll all work it out. 
It has to be a very structured kind of bottom-up approach, which is why I'm trying to put structure on how you nominate problems, how you provide feedback, how you learn, how it diffuses. Certain of the Panchat experience, I worked for three years on the Panchat Raj in India, so I know the Panchat Raj experience pretty well. Yeah, some places it failed, some places it didn't succeed, but mostly it wasn't given a chance by the top-down bureaucracies, so. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have a lot of participants on the web. I hope that you will apologize that I wasn't capable of enforcing exactly the <laughs> five o'clock time. What could be but... easier to enforce than time? <laughs> Would you please join me in thanking Lan Pritchett for a great lecture. Thank you very much. Um, we look forward to announcing next year's wider annual lecture. Look out for it on our website. The information will be there. Do follow us. Do follow what we try to inject into the development debate. Thank you very much for this afternoon.